Have you been dealing with homeowner's insurance sticker shock or has your policy been canceled? Whether you're currently living in Florida or thinking about making the move, there's a lot you need to know about the property insurance crisis that we're currently dealing with. Today, I'm going to talk with one of our Florida state senators and get the full scoop on what is being done to address our Florida property insurance problems. Hey everybody, Melanie Atkinson here, Realtor with Smith & Associates in beautiful Tampa Bay, Florida. I love doing happy episodes about how great it is to live here, but today we're going to deep dive into a very serious issue that affects all residents in the state of Florida, and that is property insurance. To help me break down this complex issue, I am honored to have as my guest, Republican Florida State Senator Jeff Brandes of District 24, which encompasses a large portion of St. Pete and Bel Air and Largo and a lot of our beaches. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Because this is primarily a real estate channel, I don't normally talk with politicians, um, but I specifically wanted to talk with you about this issue because you have been one of the loudest voices in Tallahassee about the insurance uh, issues for a very long time. Um, And this is certainly something not new in the state of Florida. And and it has been impacting people significantly in the past couple of years, and it comes up in real estate every day. Um, So we're looking to all branches of the the government right now to try to come up with some answers and some meaningful reform that will hopefully stop the bleeding. So, Senator, to start off, I have a lot of viewers who are not from the state of Florida and a lot of uh, viewers even that are here that don't really know the issue. Can we start off with you giving me a summary of what really has been going on and what brought us to the current property insurance crisis that we're dealing with. Yeah, so let's go back in time to Hurricane Andrew. Um, Before Hurricane Andrew uh, in the mid 90s, we had uh, basically three carriers, the big ones that were 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 probably 80 percent of the Florida market. And then after Hurricane Andrew, they left the Florida market and we were basically had to restart with a bunch of smaller carriers. Uh, And now we have about 60 companies, you know, 50 to 60 companies that predominantly write in Florida today. but they're, they're, they're much smaller than the state farms, the progressive of the world that were historically writing in Florida, you know, the all states that were historically writing in Florida back in the, the 80s and 90s. Um, and then we created Citizens Property Insurance Company, uh, which was the, kind of the insurer of last resort to, to kind of catch all of the policies that frankly, that the insurer frankly did, didn't want or couldn't write because they, that, that it was too risky. Um, but what's ultimately occurred now is that um, the there's been a combination of bad law, uh, bad court cases, uh, hyperactive trial bar, um, and fraud that have led to the to uh, the, this kind of insurance meltdown that we've seen, where many of these smaller companies just can't sustain the amount of litigation going on in the state of Florida. Florida represents just eight percent of total. Uh, U.S. property claims, but we are 80% of the litigation in the country is occurring in the state of Florida. We have companies that are getting sued 900 times a month, like citizens' property insurance. And many of the smaller insurance companies are getting you know, sued 60 or 70 times a week. Now, you and I, like, listen, one lawsuit would rock our world. Um, but imagine getting sued 900 times a month uh, and and how much just handle, how much it takes to just handle that level of litigation. And, and frankly, what's going on here is you and I are buying our neighbors' roofs and we're paying for it in higher property insurance premiums because roofing is the number one issue that we see being attacked right now. Um, and a lot of it's fraudulent roof claims or people knocking on people's doors. And, you know, you get this contractor that comes knocking on somebody's door and says, let me get up on your roof, take a look, uh, and we'll give you a $500 gift card. They get up there. They're not going to give out a lot of $500 gift cards without finding something. And they say, well, you know, we, well, if you just sign this document, this is an assignment of benefits. Uh, we'll take care of it all with your property insurance company. Um, and it will, you know, and you'll just have to pay the price of your deductible. Well, what ends up happening then is they hire an attorney. They go sue the, law, the, the, the property insurance company. The litigation ensues. Many of these are, these claims are over older roofs that have a lot of wear and tear damage, a lot of 20 year old roofs that were almost due to be replaced anyways. So they have normal wear and tear damage, but they're saying it was a a hailstorm that came through two years ago. A fight ensues about who should pay the claim. You know, ultimately, even if the insurance company wins the case, they've spell, spell spent thirty or forty thousand dollars in litigation uh, on, on attorney's fees, and so that that level of abuse and, frankly, the, the trial bar has essentially weaponized the law has created this property insurance crisis now, where we see these double digit rate increases year after year after year, and you know, just a system that wasn't designed for this amount of litigation. Yeah, you know, we understand um, having worked in the, the business. 
about why it's happening and why there it tends to why lawyers are all over the place here and why they are doing all these lawsuits. Explain exactly what it is about the state of Florida and what happened um, to allow this type of litigious environment here. Sure. So Florida is one of a few states in this in the country that doesn't allow actual cash value on roofs. For example, if you get into an accident, your 2010 Toyota Corolla, your property, your, your car insurance company, if you get into an accident, is not going to buy you a brand new 2022 Toyota Corolla? They're going to give you the cash value for your 2010 Toyota Corolla. But if you have a if you have a 25 year old roof and you claim that there was hail damage two years ago, um, and you can successfully, you know, you you successfully file a claim with your property insurance company. Your property insurance company has to bu- put on a brand new roof. The same, and, and maybe the price of the Toyota Corolla and the roof are the same, but they have to put on a brand new roof onto that house because they don't have an op- option to write uh, an actual cash value policy or a stated value policy or a roof schedule type of policy, which is what we see around the country. So a combination of that, and Florida is one of the few states that had what they call one-way attorneys fees which means if you sued your insurance company and you got just one dollar more than they settled for or than than they had originally adjusted the claim for then ultimately what happened is they had to pay all of the attorney's fees for you as well so what's the incentive for an attorney well the incentive for an attorney is sign up as many clients as i can because it's a numbers game for them right for them all they have to do is get $1 $1 more. And if they get $1 more on 60 or 70% of their claims, then they're going to get all of their fees paid. So for them, it was hire contractors, hire public adjusters, send them door to door, go into neighborhoods and, and get people to sign up for free roofs to get the to get the uh, legal side of that business. Um, and what we found is over the last few years, about 70% of the money paid out by insurance companies went to attorneys, uh, the, the, the plaintiff's attorneys. About 20% of that money went to the defense costs and about 10% went to homeowners to pay the actual claims. So yeah. we have this whole perverted system where you and I are paying into a property insurance company that's really not in the property insurance business. They're in the litigation management business and a bulk of the money that they're paying out is to lawyers, not to policyholders. So let's go back a little bit further because you know, in this insurance issues in the state of Florida are not new. We dealt with sinkholes, you know, way back in the day, and we all knew we were going to lose our sinkhole coverage because of all the fraud that was happening there. And I mean, the writing has been on the wall with roofs for years now. Mm -hmm. Um, Why is it that it's taken so long to address this part or this issue within the insurance policies? Well, because it's very lucrative for the attorneys, right? So the, the, what the, the attorneys can dump a ton of money into the system uh, and they can, they can, you know, ask legislators, Hey, listen, just do nothing, do, do nothing this year. When the easiest thing in the world for a politician to do is nothing, right? And so ultimately what ends up happening is the legislature continues to punt, right? And they kick the can down the road. The problem is we've run out of road. And and so we've known about these problems for years. We've known that, that, you know, that we should have, you know, the legislature should have put on actual cash value years ago. They should have gotten what are one-way attorney's fees, which were available in Florida for 100 years, but have perverted the system years ago. We were the only state in the country, including the federal government, that had a fee multiplier. So attorneys could get two or three times their fee um, and were often would often threaten the companies. Hey, if you don't pay out this claim, we're just going to go for a fee multiplier and get paid, get paid, you know, three hundred thousand dollars on what should be a hundred thousand um, dollars to on, on attorney's fees. So those types of things occurred all over the state of Florida. And frankly, it just scared companies and investors out of the business. And so what, what happened is you were left with fewer and fewer companies who didn't want to write a certain amount of risk and they wouldn't take on, you know, the, the big shift right now is getting rid of older roofs. So, you know, for, for the last few years, many companies have been just shedding comp- shedding policies that had roofs over 10 years old. And, and the, you know, that there, that creates its own other set of problems because now people are going, getting roofs replaced that are perfectly fine that have years of life left, but they have to get a roof replaced in order to get insurance. Yeah, and it's sure. also what it's, what it's also caused is, um, the company, the people that don't want to get new roofs or can't find insurance to go into citizens' property insurance. And citizens' property insurance has now grown from a couple of years ago where it's about 470,000 policies to over one, almost a million policies, or it definitely will be at a million policies by the end of the year. Yeah, I saw that stat. So let's talk about citizens' property insurance a little bit and give people um, a, a good idea of what it actually is and what it means to have that many policies under citizens' insurance from a taxpayer perspective. 
Citizens uh, Property Insurance Company is the essentially state-owned company that is the, supposedly the insurer of last resort. But unfortunately, it's become the insurer of only resort in many markets. For example, Monroe County, good luck finding another policy down in Monroe County that isn't citizens. Uh, is really difficult. They are capped at writing policies over a, mil- over a million dollars in Monroe County. And I think it's seven fifty in most other markets, or maybe it's 500 in most other markets. But um, they have grown exponentially over the last few years. And the challenge with that is we would never have let a private property insurance company grow as fast as citizens is growing. But because citizens is essentially backed by the taxpayers of the state and and the government can essentially tax every other insurance policy in the state of Florida, they are allowed to grow very, very fast. And but they don't they're not they they can't generate enough reserves in premium to kind of cover that overall risk. So they have about six billion dollars right now in reserves and about three hundred billion dollars in total risk uh, and total liabilities standing out outstanding right now. So it is incredibly, um, they will be incredibly challenged if they have a storm, because ultimately what ends up happening is one, citizens policyholders will get a massive assessment if they're an existing policyholder. And two, every other policy, every other insurance policy in the state of Florida can be assessed as well in order to pay for the insurance, for the citizens assessment. So we're, anytime somebody goes into citizens, right now, citizens is about half the price of most private market insurance because citizens' rates are not actually set by actuaries. They're set by politicians who have capped their rates and said rates can only go up you know, 10% a year, 11% a year um, in, in the citizens' property insurance pool. The problem is the market's gone up sometimes 50, sometimes 100%, depending on the company, a year. And so you, know, you can pull a policy in Pinellas County for citizens and a policy from Acme Insurance, and the, the, the difference is going to be you know, 50%. Citizens is 50% cheaper. Right. So when you say that, uh, okay, so hurricane season just started, we've already had a, a not tropical yet storm. a tropical storm out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so if a hurricane were to come and to do significant damage in, in one of our major cities with that much uh, liability that citizens has right now, you said that they could tax taxpayers on all insurance policies. So what that means for people, even if you're not homeowners and you don't have property insurance, you can tax other insurances as well, correct? Your auto, your auto policy could be taxed. There's a variety of different other policies that can be taxed uh, beyond, but it goes to citizens policyholders first. And then after citizens policyholders, it goes to, to the all the other policyholders of Florida. But if you got, for example, the 1924 storm that hit Miami, that could be a 25, 30 billion dollar event for citizens. Um, and they frankly would just very, they would, they would end up assessing every Floridian very quickly um, to, to, in order to have the funds to, to pay their claims. So citizens is truly backed by the taxpayer. Uh, and that's, that's the, the challenge that we have when citizens grows exponentially. So let's get into the roof problem, which is the, you know, as you touched on the current fraud that we're dealing with more than anything um, on the ground level from a real estate perspective, I deal with it every day. I mean, it's hard to even sell a house that's over 10 years old that has a perfectly good roof um, without we, uh, without us having insurance problems on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's also confusing for people that are coming from other states. Why do we need to replace roofs so often? Um it, there's a general hassle and a stress for homeowners and obviously a, a really large cost uh, for people that they don't need to to bear anyway. Um, it it causes a problem for housing affordability. We have insurance mm-hmm. companies that are that are dropping people because of the age of their roof. People are not expecting that to happen. You just get a letter in the mail and all of a sudden you have the hassle of finding a new insurance policy. Um, so talk about what that means for some of our you know lower income, uh, residents here in the state of Florida, elderly, um, and anyone who's just not paying attention. Yeah. If you listen, you know, you have a lot of people on a fixed income that are, you know, that are really struggling to kind of make it all ever, it all work. And all of a sudden you get a letter in the mail that says, Oh, by the way, either your policy's dropped and you got to find a new one. Um, or your premium, your premium for next year is going to be 40% higher or a thousand dollars higher than it was last year. Um, and, and that's creating all kinds of, distortion in the marketplace and problems in the marketplace. And frankly, it's a challenge with housing affordability. It's a challenge with apartment and condo affordability too. You know, apartments are paying for, for uh, premiums on property insurance as well. And they're seeing their rates go up 20 or 30% as well. So this isn't just, this isn't just localized to homeowners. This is everybody who lives in a structure in Florida. 
which hopefully is everybody. Um, yes. And I was going to say that it, it affects renters too, because obviously the, whoever owns the property is going to be passing those costs on, uh, to the renters themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so you called a special assessment on April 6th, which took place at the end of May to address all of these things. Cause it wasn't done during the regular session. Um, Give me a rundown of what happened in that uh, special session, and then we're going to talk about what you uh, what you think were the good and bad things that came out of it. So while I call help call the special session and and try to push the governor and my legislative colleagues to get into a special session to deal with these property insurance issues, because I saw the writing on the wall that this was we were really going to have problems not only in the property insurance industry. Uh, but in the reinsurance industry, because reinsurers have said they don't want to really write in Florida either. And so that, you know, the problem that you have with small, so many smaller companies in Florida is they're heavily dependent on in reinsurance, which is insurance for insurance companies. Um, and it's largely written by companies in Bermuda and London, and they write on a, na a worldwide basis. So huge, huge amount of risk that they're willing to take on, a lot of money in, involved. But when they shut you off, um, you essentially, as a Florida-based insurance company, can't write any more business and frankly may have to shut your doors because you don't have the money to pay the claims if there's actually real claims um, because you can't buy reinsurance. And that's what's happened to a few companies already this year. So and during the special session, we really, they, they you know, while I call, call the special session, unfortunately, I wasn't involved in writing the legislation uh, on this. Um, uh, so they focused on things that I think were important, really important in 2019, uh, but but really we needed to do a lot more in 2022. I, I told them, uh, I said that this is something like treating stage one cancer or like stage four cancer. And the treatments for stage four cancer are very different than the treatments for stage one cancer. Uh, and we should have treated them very differently. But what we got were stage one solutions. Uh, for example, they end the ability for contractors to, to potentially get assignments of benefits or uh, and deal with that issue. Uh, they ended the uh, the uh, the uh, fee multiplier, uh, and, which is again forty nine other states don't have it. The federal government doesn't have it, but Florida had it. So they ended the fee multiplier in Florida. Um, they also put uh, they also dropped the retention level or the 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 bottom level of the catastrophic fund of Florida, about $2 billion. We'll so put $2 billion of taxpayer money in there for a name storm or for a hurricane that, that uh, to allow insurance companies to get cheaper reinsurance uh, so that they could pass those savings on to their, their policyholders. Uh, <clears throat> in addition, they added a, a, the save our homes or not save our homes, but the, this, this provision in the bill that says that there's going to be, a, I think it's $150 million dollars for my taxpayers, safe Florida yeah, my program. safe Florida, yeah, the my safe Florida home program, which we had essentially had in 2010, but it would provide like a $10,000 grant for people to harden their homes. Mm -hmm. The problem we had with that is back in 2010, we had a ton of fraud and problems in that in that program, and about 80% of the money was really considered misspent or was was fraudulent. So we'll see how that well that plays out. But you don't get you don't you don't really make this you know make this work by by giving people money to harden their homes. It, 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 that's not the big problem. <laughs> the big problem right now is fraud and roof claims and misaligned incentives in Florida. Correct. Um, yes, I was uh, reading over that and uh, I was a little confused by the My Florida or My Safe Florida Home Program too and thought um, that that was uh, money that I'd rather be spent elsewhere. Um, right. We won't get into the reinsurance uh yeah, it's, 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 it's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. it goes to the the insurance for insurers, uh, right. insurance for insurance people. Um, it's confusing. So, um, so let's talk and go back to the roofs themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, before insurance companies were uh, dropping roof or dropping policies just based on a roof being ten years old. So, mm -hmm. what is now uh, put in place with this bill? So, under this bill, it says a roof uh, an insurance company cannot can no longer drop you if your roof is you know um, if you're just based on the age of your roof. So, if the roof is 15 years old, they can't drop you at all. Um, if it's over 15 years old and you get a letter that says, "Hey, I've got at least five years of life of useful life left." They, they can't drop you for the purpose of the age of the roof. Now they can still drop you for the age of the home or they can find one of a hundred other reasons to drop you. And so we, while we've taken away this one tool, which was frankly very, you know, that, that insurance companies use quite a bit because they have to manage the risk inside of their book too. Uh, they can't concentrate all their risk in Pinellas County. They can't concentrate it all in Miami. That would be basically bad, you know, a bad risk, a bad insurance company for doing that because they would have too much risk in one area. Um, they also didn't want to have 
a bunch of 20 year old roofs because that's where all the problems were. Sorry. And so what, so what they've done is they've, they're, they've, many of these companies have limited the amount of, of risk that they would take on by ensuring that they only wrote newer roofs. Um, but the state now has come in and said, you can't do that. So you've been pretty vocal about the fact that you're concerned about uh, the roof issue still, even after this bill, um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that insurance companies are going to want to stay in Florida. And I think that's where my my concern is, is it seems like they've addressed some individual issues, but it also doesn't seem like doing insurance business in Florida is good business, as you talked about. So how are we going to keep people here and keep the competition up? Well, right. This is the problem is if you have companies leaving the market and if they are shutting down, which is what's happening today in Florida right now, um, and investors not coming in and starting new companies to, to write insurance, then you have less and less of, of, of a market for for policyholders with fewer and fewer options and higher, higher, higher and higher prices. So it's kind of the worst of all worlds. And so by limiting the type of risk that a property insurance company can write, you disincentivize them from writing more business in the state. So we've already seen companies shutting off not just older older roofs because they can't do that anymore. They'll just shut off the entire county and say, oh, we're not going to write in Brevard. We're not going to write in Miami-Dade. We're not going to write in Lee. Uh, and we're not going to write in Orange, Seminole, Osceola, um, and and um, in some of the other counties of Florida. So they're, they're, they're going to have to, they have to manage their book, right? They have to manage their overall risk portfolio. And so what we've done is essentially just force them to move into another way to, to manage their risk. Right. So um, a separate roof deductibles is part of the bill as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we saw that when we all lost our sinkhole coverage. I mean, obviously you can get it and pay for it, but no one does anymore. So explain what the separate roof deductible portion of the bill is. Well, basically there we're trying to incentivize people to select the, the, the separate roof deductible specifically on older roofs um, because that's where, again, all the fraud is. And so what we're trying to, the, the legislature tried to do, I don't think they did it the right way, but what they tried to do is realign incentives so that people would be incentivized to one, replace the roof when it's necessary, two, not file claims uh, that aren't legitimate, um, and three, be thoughtful about the, the, the type of damage that they are filing claims on. Yeah, and there was a couple of things about this part that, that I liked. If you lose the roof due to hurricane damage, you're not, you wouldn't have to pay mm -hmm. for your roof deductible. That would be covered under the hurricane um, deductible or tree falling. So it was, it, there's parts of it that I liked about it. And, and frankly, I don't really, as a homeowner, as a real estate agent, I don't really see an issue with people, you know, being able to choose whether they want to pay for the roof deductible. Um, that seems to address some of the issues as long as it's handled correctly, of course. Um, yeah, I just would have liked to have seen actual cash value or a stated value put on that as well. Well, and the uh, other thing is I didn't see any changes about the 25% rule um, as as far as damage to, they have to replace the whole roof if it's more than 25%. Correct? Yeah. So, th so they did change that in the building code bill, um, okay, which was code. passed, which passed along with the, the um, property insurance bill. So what is it now? Uh, it just gives more flexibility to repair versus replace. And so yeah. we're trying to get up to that 50% standard. Yeah. 25% is not very much of a roof. No, we're the, we're the, right. We're the only state in the country that had 25% as a standard. Yeah. So lots of things. So let's talk about how, um, you know, we're, you've said a couple of times that we're the only state in the country. And as much as I like to be special, um, I don't really want to be special in the bad ways. Right. So can you talk about what some of the other states that also are hurricane prone states do that we're not doing? Absolutely. Sure. So let's look at Texas. Uh, for example, Texas doesn't allow for assignment of benefits. Texas and North Carolina, both of those states don't allow for assignment of benefits. Many states don't offer one-way attorney's fees. That would be probably the number one thing we could do to just kind of disincentivize people and, and you know, to, to from filing AOBs or filing litigation uh, is everybody pays their own attorney's fees. So this is, if you, you know, in most other cases, this is the this case. If you want to sue somebody, you're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to pay your own attorney's fees. Um so that would be another thing to, that we could do. But the moving to actual cash value on roofs, again, I think 40 other states have actual cash value on roofs. If you did those three things, you would radically change the property insurance market in Florida. Rates would come down. More competition would ensue. And people would still have access to the courts and still have access to, to getting their, their claims paid. But frankly, it would, it, would, it would normalize the market. We wouldn't be a state where we have 100,000 lawsuits a year. And other states our size have a thousand. 
Yeah. Um, I, I'll play devil's advocate for a second, just sure. because I know there'll be attorneys that will be watching this. Um, so if we take away the fee multipliers and, and all of those things, do you think that there's any risk of, um, uh, you know, the, the regular insurance policies not uh, being paid out um, because the threat of being sued is a lot less than than what it was, uh, how easy it is now. Are no, we worried because, about that? Not really, because there's a, a variety of different uh, mechanisms for alternative dispute resolution. Look, we want you treated fairly by your insurance company. And so we offer mediation, arbitration, appraisal. Those are all mechanisms available to policyholders. You know, under appraisal, the insurance company gets does their adjustment. You can go out and get your own adjustment done. You go to an appraiser and the appraiser then, you know, they're basically the umpire. He determines who's right and who's wrong. And sometimes they just split the baby and say, all right, we're going to get the, get the we're, we'll meet you in the middle. And is everybody OK with this number? Um, but ultimately, we can't be a state that is 80 percent of the litigation in the country on one topic. And we can't have over 100,000 lawsuits a year because what insurance companies do is just bake that into their rates because they have to pay those claims. They have to pay that, that, those attorneys. And, and you know, they're, they, they're, they're not going to just continue to lose money forever because their investors will all pull out and they'll just shut down the business. And then we'll be just left with citizens where you and I are the ones that are backing. So, listen, we should all want our insurance companies to make a little bit of money, not too much, but we want them to pay enough to pay their claims um, and to keep people interested in being in the business in Florida. Um, yeah. what, what's happening today is they're pulling out because it's not an interesting business and they lost a billion five in 2020. They lost a billion five in 2021 and consumers are the ones and that are, that are, that are paying the price. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I guess I'll, you, I'll say what everyone's probably thinking is it's, it's, it's super frustrating um, yeah. for everybody. I mean, you're dealing with two people, attorneys and insurance companies um, and you know, one's making a ton of money, one's not making enough money, and it all just comes back on all of us, um, which is really frustrating. So I'll just verbalize that for everybody yeah, else listen, who's thinking listen. that. <laughs> no, nobody loves their insurance company. And right. I'm not here to play, you know, I'm not here to, to be on the side of insurance companies. Uh, but what we've seen right now is just basically a weaponization of the law by the trial bar, because it's really concentrated in a handful of, comp you know, uh, of, of attorneys who have turned their law firms into smoke billowing factories of litigation um, and, and have hired an army of contractors to go out and generate litigation for them um, in order to get to the legal feed side there, you know, and people are caught in the middle. This is the, this is just, and, and, and are being used to kind of fuel the, the fire that, that has started in the property insurance industry in the state of Florida. And so this is a much bigger scale than, you know, one policyholder, one insurance company. This is tens of thousands of lawsuits being generated um, in, in, and, and frankly, claims being manufactured in an insurance company, which is trying to look at histor history to understand what they need to charge next year um, based on claims is going, listen, we're not looking at storm damage anymore. We're looking at manufactured claims plus storm damage and trying to figure out what we need to charge based on that. And that moves us away from actuarial science, which is what insurance is based on, into kind of a mythical uh, uh, a quagmire of what we should charge because we don't know how much we're going to get sued. And we have now that we've taken away the ability to limit roofs, we've now taken away the one tool they have to manage the risk. So it's it, the consumers are just caught in the middle of this thing. And this is the worst part. Listen, insurance companies are big boys. They're going to figure out how to run their company or they're going to shut the thing down because it's a bad investment. The lawyers, they just want to find people to sue, right? They're, they're in the business of litigation. And what we see is these companies, while they're put a good face on and say, hey, listen, we're out here to protect our consumers. When you're hiring contractors to go into neighborhoods to generate lawsuits, it isn't about protecting your consumer. It's about generating legal fees. And that's what's going on right now. Right. Um, so obviously, we had some sort of resolutions in the special session. When do these start? Um, are we still you know, working through all these lawsuits, when can we expect to see them be reduced if they are going to be reduced? And are, are we at risks of portions of this bill being challenged in the yeah. courts that might change some, some things? So really the, 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 the legislation will start really July 1. Um, but the problem with Florida insurance and specifically insurance legislation is it takes about 18 to 24 months for us to see the results in the policies because people are under their current policy 
Um, and, you know, they, they, they won't get the new policy with the new changes really until renewal, which for many, com- for many of them will be 12 months from now. And so it takes a lot of time for us to begin to see these overall changes in the marketplace. But in the meantime, the trial bar retools and finds new things to go after. And they've already challenged uh, with a number of court cases against the litigation that's pending, pending right now, or it's gotten the governor's senator, but, but is, it is in the process of becoming law. But there's already lawsuits against the, the existing uh, piece of legislation, as well as the one we passed in 2021. So we're, we're watching this continue to pay play through. And, and frankly, based on the litig- that, those lawsuits, you could see us you know, right back in the place where we're back over 100,000 law- lawsuits um, ne- at the end of the year and rates, again, going up another 20 or 30 percent. I'm looking for some good news here, Senator. I wish, <laughs> listen, listen, I wish there was. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, my, my problem is I tell the truth about what I see out in the marketplace. Right. And, 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 you know, I, I feel like I know too much on some of this stuff because I'm watching this train wreck occur. And, you know, you watch three companies go under in the last three months. We had FedNat just cancel 70,000 policies a, a week before hurricane season. You've seen other companies shedding policies and, and um, and shutting off counties just as hurricane season starts. So this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And it's going to take this the legislature coming back into special session, uh, not in special session, but probably either special session or regular session right after the election in November. But for many of Florida homeowners, like they're, they're just stuck between now and November. And that's the worst part for me is because I'm seeing my friends and neighbors struggle and, and open their insurance premium renewals and, and get sticker shock and fall out of their chair or get denied coverage and, and then be forced to go into citizens. Yeah, it's it's very difficult from my perspective as well. Obviously, you're you're trying to explain insurance to to new people in the state, and then things are changing. Their prices are changing, budgets are changing. Right now, we have house prices increasing, interest rates increasing, right. insurance increasing. Their property taxes are going to increase, especially if they bought a house that's been owned for 20 years by somebody else. It's it's just all across the board. Uh, the housing increase monthly budgets are increasing tremendously. So I try very hard to educate my clients th- uh, of that. But I don't know if if that is, you know, what everybody is getting whenever they're moving to the state of Florida as they are in droves, which, you know, obviously we welcome them here. Well, that's the challenge is people are used to paying, you know, $1,000, $1,500 for property insurance in, you know, in, in the states that they're coming from. And they're moving to a state where now all of a sudden they open their bill and it's $3,500 or $4,000 for the exact same coverage that they bought up north um, for their for their three bedroom, two bathroom house. And, you know, it's 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 just simply not sustainable. We can't see a place in Florida where people are paying more for their property insurance than they are for their mortgage. And we haven't even talked about what's going on in the condo space where we're seeing rates go up, you know, 50 to 70 percent a year um, for condo insurance after after Surfside. Yeah. So it's you, you, we've got real issues in, 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 in insurance really is the Achilles heel of the Florida real estate market. Um, well, that's scary. Um, well, <laughs> um, we're, we're going to have to keep talking about this then. So you mentioned the election in November um, without, you know, really getting too much into politics. What should we as Florida citizens be listening for um, with the people that we're voting for in November to to try to get people in here that are going to advocate for changes? Because uh, most people probably don't know, but you you can't run anymore. So um, so you have to, uh, you know, pass the baton to somebody. Yeah. So I'm termed out in November, but uh, but people should be taking their insurance renewals and they should be sending them to their local state state reps and state senators. And they should be telling them what their percentage increase was and ask them what they're going to do about it. Um, they should be putting them they should be really holding their feet to the fire, but they need to be educated on the topic first. You know, They need to understand. They need to make sure that their local elected officials understand what this really means to them, that this is a table, this is a kitchen table pocketbook issue that is affecting every Floridian uh, and that that. that They expect their legislators to work on this and do something. What we saw out of Tallahassee during the special session, I think what you're going to see next year is there is bipartisan support for insurance reform. But we have to have the courage to do it. And we have to encourage to fix the right things. Listen, oftentimes the state will say, listen, we're going to just copy one other state and we'll do what they did because we saw we, we saw the results that we want the results that they got. But they only copy six of the eight things or six of the 10 things that that state did. Um, and, and that's kind of like baking a cake, but adding only six of the 10 ingredients that were required in the recipe, you're going to get a different result. Um, and, and so what we saw is, you know, Florida said, oh, we passed the Texas legislation back in 2021. Well, we passed a piece of it, but we only passed six of the 10 things. And if we had passed all 10, 
then we would have seen similar results, but we didn't. Well, I would ask um, who everyone's afraid of, but I think I already know the answer to that, as everyone else probably does too. Just um, just so people know, the special session bill was passed the Senate 30, 30 to 9 and the House 95-14. So it mm -hmm. did have bipartisan support. Overwhelming bipartisan support, yeah. Right. Um, which makes sense. This is obviously an issue that affects everybody. Sure. Um, so, okay. So we should be sending our, our policies to our legislators and... Um, hoping that they take this on and um, uh, get some uh, more solutions here. So um, I'm going to ask you uh, just a casual question since you're sure. here in our area. This is Melanie Loves Tampa Bay. So um, you live in St. Pete. Um, just for all the viewers that are moving down here, just, you know, on a normal day in St. Pete, what do you like to do? What are some of your secret favorite restaurants and things like that in St. Pete? Uh, listen, I love, I've lived here my entire life. I grew up here, was born and raised here, uh, went to school here. And, uh, and so uh, this is just a wonderful place to live. This is honestly, uh, if you can live anywhere in Florida, the Tampa Bay market is, is probably the best place to live. You don't have to fight the traffic of Miami. You have a great international airport to, to fly into with, with great access. Uh, you have great beaches. Although if you live here long enough, like me, you don't go no, nearly enough. <laughs> that's the, that's the I don't secret like of, sand. <laughs> well, it's the secret of like people who live in St. Pete, like, we'll go, go to the beach. What are you talking about? Um, we'll yeah. go to the pool. Exactly. Uh, the pool or boats. The, the pool of the boats. Right. <laughs> Um, but you know, listen, anywhere in downtown St. Pete is, is, um, just incredible. And there's so many great restaurants along the waterfront, uh, and, and, and beachfront. Uh, but I, you know, I, I tend to go to the Columbia every now and then I love, I love the Columbia. I love the food there. Uh, I love downtown St. Pete and, and some of the great restaurants that have come on down downtown, but really it's amazing how much our city's changing and becoming like a foodie town. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but St. Pete's got some, you know, challenges. It's, you know, the the, the challenges of, of making housing more affordable and finding uh, places for people to rent and, and stay. That's that's a big challenge right now. Um, we're we're, you know, we're a peninsula on a peninsula, and so we have a problem where we don't have enough housing stock to meet the demand, and we can't get it. Frankly, it's just not going to not going to be available because there's no green space left. We're we're at a place where you know there's no there's no new places to build. So we're we're in the process of redeveloping St. Pete, and that's going to create some some challenges uh, and a lot of great opportunities. But we're getting the benefits of density, which is a lot more restaurants, a lot more shopping, a lot more amenities and venues uh, because we have so many people living here, and people just want to live here because it's a great place, and all, obviously the sports teams and everything else help add to the amenities that the community offers. Yeah, I was actually in downtown St. Pete this weekend at the Floridian Social Club, and and I go there regularly, but um, I had was walking down Central, and there were two new restaurants. And I, it mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago that I was there, maybe a month ago. And I'm like, where did these restaurants even come from? But um, that's one of the things that I uh, talk to people about a lot is the difference between downtown St. Pete, downtown Tampa. They're, they're very different. St. Pete already has an identity. It has mm -hmm. a great vibe to it already. It has lots of restaurants and lots of things to do and so many cool things coming up in the future. Um, so, uh, you know, we get to enjoy both cities when we live here, which I think is great. Absolutely. Listen, down, downtown Tampa for years was just a business district. Mm -hmm. um, and what they recognized is that they, you actually need people to live down there as well. And so they spent a lot of time, effort, and energy to try to bring more condo development, more apartments downtown. So we actually have a live, work, play community, mm -hmm. um, which is beginning to do. And obviously, Jeff Phoenix having a huge impact in that, in, in adding amenities and hotels and other features to the, down, to the downtown core, which is going to create a lot more people living down there because you really need density to have that downtown core survive. St. Pete um, did that uh, about a decade and a half ago, mm -hmm. where they made that major move um, under Mayor B Rick Baker to really focus on condo development, apartments, and that, you know, his mantra was great cities have great downtowns. And he focused on the downtown core and, and St. Pete has really reaped the benefits of that. Yeah, it's a wonderful city. Um, I love going to it uh, very much. And uh, uh, we have lots of development working with Smith. We, we represent most of the large condo towers that are being mm -hmm. built down there. So um, uh, we, you know, there all the time showing those. Um, well, uh, thank you for lightening up the, uh, <laughs> the, the it, it, episode it's, a little yeah. bit. It um, can start talking about property insurance. It's, it it's, does. It's, you know. and, and, you know, like I said at the beginning, I don't like uh, focusing on the negative, but it is a very important issue for all of us here in, in Florida. So thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for everything that you've tried to do um, so far. And I guess keep up the good work until you're all finished up. And um, 
Yeah. So anyone else out there who has questions, um, we will put some contact information into the description box of this video. Um, but for now, um, that's about it. Thanks all for watching. With love, Melanie.